Since March 2020, clinicians and scientists have tested and tried many existing FDA-approved drugs to treat COVID-19, but only a few have made it and remained on the NIH-recommended treatment protocol. Currently, the only old and low-cost drugs for treating hospitalized COVID-19 patients are dexamethasone, a steroidal drug that can suppress the overreactive immune system. And heparin to prevent blood clots in hospitalized patients. All the other approved or authorized treatments for mild to severe COVID-19 patients bear a significant cost to taxpayers and government budgets in the long run. Many clinical trials are still looking for strong evidence to repurpose existing off-patent drugs to help COVID patients. So far. The quest has yielded significant debate and fractured the scientific and medical communities. But why is it so difficult to repurpose cheap old drugs? Were clinical trials designed to fail, or are there factors that researchers had overlooked? Let's find out. I'm Dr. Han, and welcome to my classroom. First, let's look at what are the differences between trials for new drugs and old drugs. The steps involved in developing new drugs and repurposing approved old drugs are significantly different. In new drug development, many potential drug candidates are first screened by computational models and in vitro testings. Promising candidates will then be studied extensively in animal models. These early studies can establish the knowledge of the mechanisms of drugs and how living bodies process new drugs. Further studies in human continue to answer questions related to how the drug affects the human body and how the human body affects the drug. These are commonly known as pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic factors. The final stages of the clinical trials would fill the last two pieces of clinical knowledge related to safety and efficacy. An extensive amount of basic science knowledge has to be built up before a new drug is approved for a given disease, and usually, the approved indication of a new drug is only for one specific disease condition. Sometimes, new drug manufacturers may observe unexpected clinical events during trials, and they may pursue off-label studies to gain an additional indication of the new drug. This type of repurposing study is usually well-funded and well-designed because new drugs are still under patent, and a new indication can generate additional exclusive revenue for the manufacturer. After the patent of the drug is expired and can be produced by generic drug manufacturers, the lack of significant financial gain is likely why old drug repurposing studies are often only done by clinicians and academic scientists. The goal for this second type of trial is aimed to prove efficacy and safety, so old drugs can gain new indications and benefit patients. There are a number of clinical trials aimed to repurpose an antiparasitic drug, ivermectin, to treat COVID. Most studies suggest that ivermectin has little to no significant benefits, and the sample size and trial designs are often criticized for being biased toward either side of the result. But other than clinical trial designs. There are basic unsolved scientific questions that may contribute to the different results we are seeing. First, let's look at unsolved drug target issues or the pharmacodynamic factors. When clinicians repurposed dexamethasone for hospitalized COVID-19 patients, they knew dexamethasone has an established mechanism to suppress uncontrolled inflammation, and had good reason to believe it could offer the same benefit for severe COVID-19 patients. And in terms of heparin, the long history of using this drug to treat blood clots was also believed it could help blood clots observed in severe COVID-19 patients. And even with repurposing 
remdesivir, a drug that was initially developed to treat Ebola virus, clinicians believed the same drug mechanism could also inhibit the SARS-CoV-2 viral cycle. However, repurposing drugs that have less targeted mechanisms have been much less successful. In particular, antiparasitics and antibiotics advocated by some frontline clinicians have not shown consistent benefits in clinical trials. Take ivermectin as an example. Even though there are favorable in vitro and computer modeling data for its use. The exact mechanism or pharmacodynamic of how this drug may help in human body remains elusive. So, could there be overlooked drug-drug and drug-food interactions or pharmacokinetic parameters when studying these repurposed drugs? One of the most well-organized clinical trials investigating the efficacy of repurposing treatments for COVID-19. Together, COVID-19 trials has recently published their findings of using ivermectin in early COVID-19 treatment. The study reported that ivermectin was not helpful in keeping patients from being admitted to hospitals. In addition to the main study report, the authors also published an appendix to tell the public how they determined the drug dose and the methods they used to measure. M model ivermectin plasma concentration for its potential direct and indirect effects. These methodologies are rarely seen in other ivermectin studies. But is it without limitations? The entire Together COVID-19 trial carefully excluded patients taking drugs that can affect serotonin levels and the sympathetic nervous system. Those drugs were excluded because in this trial, two of the studied drugs, doxorubicin and fluvoxamine, can mediate serotonin and the sympathetic nervous system. This trial did not exclude patients from taking any other drugs that was not listed in that exclusion criteria. But does it matter? What other drugs or food could potentially affect the level of ivermectin in the body? Now, before we can answer this question, we need to first understand how ivermectin enters and is metabolized in the human body. Ivermectin is metabolized by an enzyme called CYP3A4. CYP3A4 is one of many drug metabolizing enzymes called cytochrome P450. CYP3A4 can be found in both the small intestine and the liver. Where it functions as a barrier against chemicals or xenobiotics that could potentially be harmful, drugs extensively metabolized by 3A4 tend to have a lower available concentration in the body and require a higher dose to achieve therapeutic levels. More than 50% of drugs are in fact also metabolized by 3A4, many of which can also either make the enzyme work better or worse. These compounds are called 3A4 inducers and 3A4 inhibitors. Patients taking these drugs can affect the level of ivermectin in the body. Food and drink, such as grapefruit juice, is also a 3A4 inhibitor that can increase the ivermectin level. Ivermectin is also a substrate and a potent inducer of a transport protein called PGP. Or P glycoprotein, PGP is also known as multi-drug resistant protein that is located in the intestine, and these proteins are responsible for pumping drugs out from the system back to the intestinal space to prevent absorption. And human physiology has this building mechanism to prevent ivermectin from entering the body. When patients are taking drugs such as antibiotics like erythromycin, azithromycin, and antifungal drugs such as ketoconazole, these drugs can make both 3A4 and PGP work less efficiently. These combined effects can significantly increase the level of ivermectin detected in the blood. A previous study has shown that azithromycin can increase the level of ivermectin in the body by up to 37 percent. 
Some experimental treatment protocols has indeed combined using azithromycin and ivermectin. In fact, it is a common practice to combine a 3A4 inhibitor with another drug to achieve desirable therapeutic outcomes. The newly authorized oral treatment for early COVID-19, Paxlovid, which is marketed by Pfizer, also uses rotanavir to capitalize this 3A4 inhibition strategy to increase the other drug's level in the body. Other than the known factors, there are also unknown human genomic factors that can affect repurposing old drugs. The human population also carries differences in their genetic makeup that can affect how the body processes drugs. These genetic differences are called polymorphism, and the studies are called pharmacogenomics. It is well known that polymorphism in drug metabolizing enzymes can have an important and notable effect on both the therapeutic and side effects of drugs. However, we currently have very little knowledge of the clinical implications of how the human genome can have an effect on ivermectin and many other drugs in the repurposed pipeline. The bottom line is that all of the old drugs were not originally designed to fight a new disease, and under a normal time, drug repurposing studies should still go through target validations and basic science studies before clinical trials. But during pandemic, the quest of finding clinical data to support repurposing old drugs for new indications is urgent. And clinical researchers sometimes may have overlooked the basic science questions that could lead to inconsistent results in patients. I understand this video is unusually deep in science, and in particular when I brought up how genes can affect drug responses. Now, this is also why I will be starting a new series to explain how genes can affect nutritional levels, drug responses. Chronic diseases and your overall health. So, if you think I have earned your interest in learning more on these topics, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel, so that more people can learn from it. And again, thank you very much for all of your support, and I hope to see you again in my next video. Meanwhile, please stay safe, stay healthy, and take care. Bye.